Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here and on this uh, beautiful afternoon. Uh, today I wish I was out in the spillway or somewhere else out in the outdoors. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today about something I'm very passionate about and I think something is critical to us. And that is both uh, coastal restoration as well as flood control. Just recently they had an article in the paper, it was in the letter to the editor, which kind of spurned my attention and made me kind of dig through some of my correspondence. And that was a letter from Chip Klein about the coastal loss, our loss opportunity with the recent high water and the failure of us or the state and the Corps of Engineers to start embracing some of these water diversion projects. Because if we're only gonna, if we're gonna have a chance to rebuild Louisiana, we're gonna have to have coastal diversion projects, some sediment carrying projects. And of course this year, the Mississippi River is at record high level. It's causing problems with navigation. You got extreme currents. And some of you, you who cross the Mississippi River daily may look off the over the bridge, look over into the river like I do. I have particularly noticed something on the way to Donisonville the last couple of weeks. There's a navigation buoy in the middle of the river and it's tethered to the bottom of the river. It's a big green buoy. Well, the last couple of times I went over the river, you couldn't see the buoy because the current was flowing so fast that it looked like a submarine periscope. All you could see was the wake, which then I have some other friends. I do a lot of outdoor uh, activities like Delia mentioned. And just recently I had some friends that we were down on the Atchafalaya Bay, down at the mouth of the Atchafalaya River. And the currents down there are unbelievable. The Atchafalaya takes about 33% or 30% of the Mississippi's flow. Uh, I hunted down there in December and January and the currents were unbelievable at that time because of the prolonged high water. Matter of fact, they moved their houseboat recently, last weekend, and to show you the amount of current it had, they had two 115 horsepower outboards on it. They pulled into the Atchafalaya River and tried to go upstream. They were going one mile an hour. They had to wind up hooking two other boats to it with a 250 and a 125 to be able to go upstream and were able to go at three miles an hour to buck the current until they reached Bayou Shane. Which brings me back to the letter from Chip Klein. You know, as a small child, I fished with my father in the Lake Maurepas Basin, which is probably one of the biggest uh, coastal forests that we have left that is uh, it's still, you know, intact. But on, it's going, undergoing a tremendous amount of stress. That area was logged in around 1900 to about 19. 30s. Uh, so I, my family might wound up moving to French settlement, from French settlement to Sorrento to work in the mill or to, to have a store there. Well, I started going into that swamp, I guess, when I was about four years old with my dad fishing. I can remember going, uh, putting in at Blind River, going down Pity Amid, going down uh, Shenblon, in those areas. Well, over the last 30 years, we've seen a tremendous amount of loss of the cypress forest in that area as well as the tupelo gum trees. It is starting to deforest where your tupelo gums are starting to die. Now that is very critical to those of us who live in Livingston, Ascension, St. James, uh, St. John. Because if you remember back in, as a result of Hurricane Isaac, we had a tremendous amount of flooding there. A lot of those areas flooded, especially Laplace, areas in Lower Livingston and Bear Island that had never flooded, flooded before. And a lot of that is as a result of our, our wetlands loss. When Chip Klein wrote his letter, that made me start thinking again that, you know, with the high levels in the Mississippi River, it would seem that we need to start looking at a common sense approach. We have undergone a tremendous amount of high water in Baton Rouge. Uh, the river has been out of its banks or above flood stage for probably over two months. The last probably close to three weeks, we've been above 40 foot at Baton Rouge. It's going to stay above 40 foot. We've seen levee failures in Nebraska. And God help us if we were to see something like that happen here. And that brings me back to the story about the rising tide, the book 
that I'd read. I was one I was sitting on the Natural Resources Committee a while back. The author had sent me a copy of it, and I started reading it. And you know, with the Mississippi River, right now what we've done, as well as the Atchafalaya, we've tried to contain it between levees. We've also tried to get some of these coastal diversion projects, which would help build some sediment, help restore some of our wetlands, but we've run into a tremendous roadblocks with the Corps of Engineers trying to get some of these going. Like once, for instance, Hope Canal down in St. John Parish has probably been on the books for about 30 years. Is now just may start moving forward, which is only a small project. But that show you the difference in the weather patterns. Over the last four years, we've had to open the Bonnie Carey Spillway three times, which is really unheard of. The spillway was opened. I had some statistics that were sent to me. Uh, I think the first time or one of the times it was opened in 1937 uh, was one time and it's been opened only approximately 13 times since then. And really in the last four years, it's been opened three times. And if you look back in 2011 and 2008, it was opened again, which is indicating to me, at least to what we need to be looking at, we have changing weather patterns. There's more and more water going into the Mississippi. Our levees are under more and more stress. And really what needs to happen is, is hopefully what we can start doing is we need to start gaining some traction and maybe the Corps needs to reevaluate their management of the river. If we could start doing water diversion somewhere in the neighborhood of, like in Maurepas, there's one right now going to be at Union that is proposed in the 2017 plan at about 25,000 cubic feet per second. Well, if you could take four or five of those projects and start opening those spillways or letting those water projects start working, you'd have a tremendous advantage to the areas between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Like the Maurepas Swamp, which is all basically almost state-owned, would refurbish that swamp, would help protect our coastal barriers. You've got places like Davis Pond that you have a 10,000 cubic foot diversion right now. That probably needs to be opened up, which would put water into that uh, Salvador, Lake Katawachi area, you probably need to look at something like around Des Islands and putting some in those which would help refurbish the whole marsh in the Terrebonne and Lafourche regions. Uh, to me it's kind of like common sense because what we're faced with now is increasingly high river currents which are making it difficult for navigation. You've got ships now that are at risk uh, when they try to move them because of the water levels. We've had two tugboats that have sunk recently because of the currents in the river. And it just seems like not only should we be looking at coastal restoration projects with diversions, but the Corps also needs to incorporate this into flood control. Because if we could put a couple of those projects with 25,000, 50,000 cubic foot between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, it would really do a lot of good and lessen some of our our issues and it would also protect our coastal barriers from hurricane surge. Uh, hopefully the Corps will start changing its patterns on these uh, and maybe start pushing some of these projects but it's like unfortunately a lot of times you got to make people think it's their idea. So hopefully the Corps will start looking at this and maybe start developing this because I don't think we can keep going the way we're going with this much water coming down the river. As you know, in Nebraska, they're having those issues. Luckily, we have a little bit of fall coming down the Ohio River, but that can turn around very soon. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. Um, I'd like to be to the point. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, some diversions <coughs> like at Canard, which are a freshwater diversion, uh, that impacts oysters Well, and I'm going to go back to Carnarvon, and that's one of the things I mentioned in my letter. A lot of these freshwater diversions, we have a bird, bird foot delta with the Mississippi River. And a lot of those diversions are way down. I think they need to be further up. And that's, and 
basically they need to be between Baton Rouge and New Orleans because that gives the best flood control and also what it does, you're not going to have the impact on the oyster fisheries or some of the saltwater fisheries. If you had like the one at Maurepas, the Union one, that's going to be going through the swamp at, Mar at Maurepas Blind River, which is going to absorb the nitrogen in the water. It also has a big flood plain. Also, like Davis Pond and some of those. Now, when you do go down further south, like Carnarvon and some of those, you would have a problem. It, you could have some effects. I think they have the mid Barataria is one of them that they're concerned with. But my thing is they need to be forward, further up the river, which is does some flood control benefits. Of course, they have to be strategically located. Although it occurred naturally, and so it didn't cost the state to be in, Mardi Gras has one such pattern, yeah. right? Well, it's actually it occurred naturally. All right. So uh, are we trying to undo the things that occurred naturally? No, what I'm saying is we need a return to back what we were doing naturally as a result of flood control. And I've, all you have to do is look at the Wax Lake outlet. Any of y'all who have ever been to Wax Lake, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who have not been there and on the Atchafalaya Delta, it is truly remarkable to see how the land is being built there and the difference in the, the, the whole area. I mean, it's all green, it's, it's growing marsh. It's what used to happen. And what we are happening now is we cannot contain the river in these levees. I think what we're going to do is ultimately we're going to have a problem. And when it does, it's going to be worse than, than 1927. I think the Corps needs to reevaluate how you're going to manage the Mississippi River. And by putting more of these diversions, I think what happens is you have less tendency for the river to want to change course because it wants to change course at the Atchafalaya. Yes, sir. All right. So um, obviously we're talking about what the Army Corps could do. Is there anything at the legislative level that you would like to see? harass the Corps to do it. I think is what basically we have to do because I think the Corps has its own mind and I think we have to start advancing these ideas but but part of the problem is the mid Barataria one they've been trying to permit it for years and what has happened is it has been it pushed back. Hope Canal has been a small diversion which has been going on since my kids were at St. Teresa and it keeps dying and now they're looking at bringing it back as part of the West Shore project as a mitigation. I mean, they're common sense and we need to return to what originally was there it, as best we can, as strategically as we can. Yes, sir. Senator, since you brought up in Barrett that's a multi, more than a billion dollar project. Um, you know, and where, where, you know, how, how do we fund uh, the, the kind of mega projects in that category? And how much will, will upriver diversions cost because both the Coast Guard and the Corps are involved in that. We have tons of industry in your area uh, and, and the up and down the river that might be might be affected by some of this uh, some of this work. So is there a isn't it a complex undertaking the higher up the river you go? It's a complex undertaking, but I think it's manageable. I mean, you can look at some of them, like Bayou Lafouche needs, to be, there's a small amount of water going through it, more of it needs to be going through. I mean, I think we don't have an alternative because what's gonna happen is the coast keeps eroding. Uh, I don't know if you're gonna be able to contain the river forever. Uh, we're seeing higher and higher levels. When you're looking at Bonnie Carey opened, right now it's flowing when it's open wide open that's 300,000 cubic feet per second so if you're talking about navigation issues they're using Bonnie Carey right now it is flowing at a 300,000 cubic foot uh, rate when it's open so I think you can work around the navigation issues and also by not having to use Bonnie Carey as much you probably have less impact on the saltwater fisheries because if you were pushing it through uh, Manshack or Maurepas coming into Lake Maurepas, you're going to also probably help the dead zone by absorbing some of the nitrogen in the swamp. Sir, uh, since we're recording and we can't... You need to repeat the question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thanks. Yes, sir. The last I heard was kind of afraid to have to use um, the structure at Marco City again. Marganza. All right, the question was, were we afraid to use the Morganza, the Morganza spillway? Uh, I think they are afraid to use the Morganza spillway because I'm going to tell you what happens. Uh, I own property in Pierre Park, for me with the Pierre Park area, Stevensville and all of that. When 
they open Morganza, you're putting a lot more water into the Atchafalaya River. What happens when it goes down the river, it goes and it hits Bayou Shane, which is in a current behind, below Morgan City. The water actually flows north. Uh, right now at my camp at uh, Pierre Port on Lake Verrett and along a lot of Bell River, I have to wear knee boots on the back to walk to where my dock is. So the problem is if you open Morganza and put that much more water into the Atchafalaya Basin, you really start having an impact on places like Stevensville, Pierre Park, those areas all the way up by Sorrel. So I think that they are concerned about it. Well, I think it's a last ditch result. You, you do that because then you're worried about the saturation of the levees between Baton Rouge and New Orleans. Well, you have to worry about the structure because the river wants to go that way and it might want to change course on us. Senator Lamb. Yes, Mr. DuPont. We're finally moving beyond a trickle on the Comeet River Diversion Canal after all these years. The question that really hasn't been answered a whole lot is, is this going to be adequate now? I mean, this was built in 19, this has been designed on 1983 standards. We've seen much greater development along these areas. Uh, do you believe it's time to maybe look at a, a much more, much broader scope on something like this and what's already in place? You're talking about this. The question is about whether or not the Comete River Diversion Project is still up to par or feasible. Right. I think it's better than nothing. I mean, I think everything changes with time. Uh, I think it would reduce some of the flooding, but you need to look at some other alternatives. One of the things that I've advocated is the problem with the Ament River Basin. It needs to be a multifaceted approach with all parishes involved. Uh, one of the things that a number of people in Ascension pointed out, and one of them that I've you know, advocated, sent a letter to the governor, and I think it was in October that was signed by our legislative delegation, is the Highway 22 uh, between the Diversion Canal Ridge the levee on a diversion canal and the lower lead uh, ridge levee. That is actually a dam. It is operating as a weir. Uh, there's not enough cuts underneath it and I think now they are looking at doing something to open some of that up to have some more water flow through there which would have a you know really good impact or at least would help Livingston Parish as much as it would help uh, Ascension Parish. Yes sir. All right, the question is, do I subscribe that man-made weather changes or the weather changes are man-made? Uh, climate change. Climate change. Well, uh, I don't think it's important to whether or not it's man-made or not. I think what you have to deal with it is there's a different situation. I mean, the weather has changed for years and once we had an ice age, then we didn't. Uh, you know, I think the earth is constantly evolving. I think what we have to do is work within the framework we have. I think there's no doubt that we're having rising sea levels, uh, you know, and weather patterns are different. And if we had an event like we had in Houston, we would have been, 2016 probably would have been uh, not very significant as compared, compared to what that could have been. But I think that goes into some of the things that I've been saying is we need to reevaluate our flood control uh, policies and that's why we need to do something with the Mississippi River as well as some of the areas like the Comed River Diversion and Highway 22 and Ascension because all of that water has to go through Port Fenson, at least as the Amen River Basin. Yes, sir. Uh, the uh, governor's office has, has talked a fair bit and has a few meetings of uh, trying to, to use some of the uh, 2016 recovery money to sweep the pot for parishes to get together in uh, flood plan. Uh, to, uh, you know, to work things better among themselves, to develop the local plan. Do you see, what do you think of this? Do you think it's a sensible enough approach? Uh, uh, is there potentially legislation that might arise from that? I think it is a sensible approach and something we should be doing, but I think what you're going to have to do, I think we're going to have to go a step further when the, the governor is proposing. I think you're going to have to have a multi-parish basin-wide uh, 
board that's going to look at these projects because what Livingston does affects what Ascension does, what Ascension does affects what Livingston does, and vice versa. And I think what you're going to have to do is probably have something in place ultimately which people may not like, but you're going to have to look at something where you're going to look at the whole basin and see what can be done. And it is a very complicated situation because when you get into the lower parts of Ascension, Livingston, St. James, a lot of that is affected by tides. And the east wind makes a big difference in what happens. Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit, excuse me, about sort of the cost of some of these diversion projects that you're calling for versus other potential solutions versus, of course, the cost of well, the, all right, what is the cost of these sol uh, solutions versus doing nothing? Or, or other potential options? Other, well, the only other potential options that you have as far as the Mississippi River is to keep raising the levees. And is that going to work? I don't know. And if then it becomes a problem. If you keep raising the levees, then when you have the catastrophe of a levee break, we're really in trouble. So. I think you have no alternative, but you're going to have to start doing something, and you're going to have to look at the most cost-effective procedures. To me, diversions are the most cost-effective procedure. The problem is we engineer things forever. I told my kids, my wife and I are both lawyers, I said, look, you don't want to be lawyers, you need to be an engineer. Because what you're going to do, you're going to study something forever and you're never going to build it and you'll just keep studying it over and over again. And unfortunately, I think that's what's happening when I look at some of the things we've studied. And I point to Hope Canal as well as some of the other things. I mean, they've studied it forever. We know it can be done. You have the technology to do it. It's easier to do it. If it doesn't work, shut it off. Yes, sir. So just bouncing off on David's question, the cost of what is that on businesses? What is that on residents? Well, the cost of doing nothing could be tremendous because you have the whole petrochemical corridor on the, on the Mississippi River. If you have a, a, a levee break, what does that do? I mean, you're talking about if you have a flood now and a levee break on the Mississippi River, this isn't like Nebraska where the water is going to go away in three days. You're going to have something that's going to be catastrophic because the water is going to go somewhere and it's going to be tremendous. I think you're going to have much more devastation than you would have ever thought. So I think you have no op uh, You have to do something. It's just, what are you going to do? Yes, sir, Mr. Hightower. Have you, uh, have you heard about or seen notice any weakness in the levee? In other words, in the past, the levee I mean, I know that, uh, have I heard of any weaknesses or in the levees or so? I think, uh, I think those situations are monitored very heavy. I think there are some that occur. I know there's been some in different places. I've seen pictures of them uh, in some of the areas. But I mean I, I mean, I think they're watching them. And the problem is the longer the river stays up, the more susceptible your levees are to failure. Yes. That might be a good thing to ask him to come do because I'd sent a letter to the Colonel Clancy a while back. I think I was looking at the letter as May 18th, you know, recommending that. And as a result of, you know, uh, Mr. Klein's letter, I think we need to look more at that because we need to get some of the water out of the river. It's just, it's too much in it. And you're going to have to put it in some areas where it can do some good. Yes, sir. We have this new whiz bank model of the Mississippi River about 200 yards south of here. Have you thought about commissioning any studies on diversion? Yes, I think they are actually uh, modeling some of them, and I think that's the perfect thing for CPRA to start looking at to see what these do. Because if you can put that much water, look, Bonnie Carey at maximum capacity is 300,000 cubic feet per second. If you take 150,000 cubic feet out by just regular diversions, you lessen the chance of having an open itch, you lessen the, uh, the damage it does to the salt water in Lake Pontchartrain. I mean, to me, I see these diversions, they have to be as far north as practical. And that means between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, you need some. 
there's a number of places on the West Bank that you could do them, or you know, make Davis Pond bigger. I mean, it's it has a beneficial effect. And there's even been a time, you know, people discuss doing a third channel, you know, to divert some of the water into the Terrebonne Lafouche areas. Do you can you give us an idea? Obviously, it's going to depend on the project. But can you give us an idea about sort of the what cost? Uh, can I give an idea of the rough cost of the diversions? I think the uh, the 25,000 cubic foot diversion that was proposed at Union in the master plan, it was total is $876,700,000, which is close to a billion dollars. But when you think about the alternative, what if you know if you can do some of these and you avert a catastrophe, it's very cheap insurance. At least that's the figures what they give on this one. But I think a lot of this stuff, you really know, you have the engineering already done, or at least you know what's going to work and what needs to be done. So, I mean, there may be, sometimes you can get things done a little better, just government pays more for things than most people do. Yes, John? You mentioned levy projects a little while ago, and Laurel Ridge came up now. Uh, Brad, this was another one that was planned as far back, I think, 1982 is when it first went on the books. And uh, at this point now, there's, well, there's a lawsuit in place, a memorandum of understanding in place. What can be done to avoid things like that to, from happening in the future? I mean, just, uh, yeah. The question is, what could be done in the future to avoid litigation between parishes, like especially between Ascension and Livingston? I think that's where you come into when you create this commission that looks at these projects, that has to be properly staffed to weigh things, to say, okay, what is, the, what is the downside of this? What is the benefit? And I think that's where you come up with this situation like you do something with Highway 22, because it is definitely a dam or a weir that is preventing water from flowing. And now some of the things you're gonna have problems with no matter what, just because of the topography. When you look at the Amid River Basin, everything has to go through Port Vincent, which narrows down. Then it narrows down, and you're basically trying to push all of the water down the diversion canal, which is basically like taking a shotgun barrel and trying to force it down, where if you could put it into the thousands of acres of swamp land where it'll disperse, you have much less impact. Some of the things that can be done is they've already started doing on the diversion canal. They cut some cuts through the levee at the Diversion Canal, which would be, I guess, on the north side. It would be on the Maripal side. You need to put some more on the south side where the water could flow towards Pity Mitt. And I'm going to give you an example of something like uh, to show you how we created our own problems. Uh, one of my constituents is Grady Malonson, who lives on Highway 22. He owns Sorrento Lumber Company. And we had got to talking about the Highway 22 situation, and he told me during the flood, in 2016, once the water was coming over the Laurel Ridge levee, he had four or five foot of water inside the levee, where if he walks over the levee where his property is at the levee, the swamp had two foot of water in it, which tells you, you know what? Where it needs to be, it's not. So we need to get it there. And I think as a result of that, they cut the levee down there at Split Log Road, which a Rogers Sea Road, which lets some of the water in Ascension drain. And, and that's where you start developing sometimes situations where you start putting in floodgates where you can let the water out. That would have probably lessened the impact in Ascension. Yes, sir. Aren't you uh, forgetting the fact that once you let the water in, and particularly like Conarman, which is fresh water, top water without the silt, once you let it in, it's going to stop. Then have to have a method or mechanization to move the soil further, and that costs money. Don't you have, aren't you leaving out the fact that we have to fund this kind of uh, uh, program that you're talking about to divert? I don't think that's necessarily the case, and I'm going to point you to uh, Wax Lake. If you look at Wax Lake, that was the Corps of Engineers cut that channel years ago, and the water, if you have enough velocity where it's carrying the sediment, it's going to spread it out. I mean, what you've got to do is have enough velocity where it'll be a uh, sediment diversion, which is probably, according to this, somewhere in a 25,000 cubic foot area, where 
you know, I don't think it creates that problem which you have, you know, with a, a situation like Carnarvon. Any other questions? Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. California is usually thought of as a wind state. It is the headquarters of Chevron as a suburb of San Francisco. Texas is actually the largest wind generator in the nation. It is headquarters of uh, uh, Exxon and Dallas and its subsidiaries in Houston. Can Louisiana live with uh, climate change as a fact and the oil industry? Can Louisiana live with the fact of climate change in the oil industry. Huh? I'm not sure what your question is asking. Can, can Louisiana recognize the scientific fact of climate change and live in harmony with the oil industry? I, I don't see where there, I mean what you're going to do is adapt to the situation. I don't know if it's called harmony. I mean, what you're going to do is adapt to the situations you have. I mean, there's no doubt that there's climate change. I think we're becoming wetter. And, you know, uh, so I mean, I don't exactly know. I guess I'm missing your question there. I think we're going to have to. There's a lot of denial by politicians in Louisiana about climate change, and they say they think and they feel it's definitely to be a denial in favor of strictly the oil industry. Okay. All right. I don't know if I agree with it's, you know, and whether or not the oil industry has caused climate change or the hydrocarbons, I don't think that's important. I think what's happening is it's occurring. So what you're going to have to do is make adaptations for it. If it is causing it, then the question becomes, what are you going to do to replace oil? We're already starting to do things with wind and some of the other things. But the problem is, what do you do until that happens? So I think what you have to do is play the hand that you're dealt. And right now is to look at some of the alternatives.